you could find your seat, that would be great. And if you have a Bible today, you can go to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 17 all the way to the end of chapter 2 today. Uh, we're in a series called Jonah, the Pursuit of God. And we're talking a bit about how Jonah has run from God. I'm going to read and then we're going to pray if you don't have a Bible uh, it'll be on the screen behind me as well, and you can follow there. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, this is what it says. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord, and out of my distress... And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you have cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land, whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up upon the dry land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to lift our voices in praise of Jesus. And we gather together today because Jesus is worthy. We gather because Jesus is alive. God, I know that your spirit wants to go to places in our hearts and our lives today. I believe he wants to root out things. I believe he wants to challenge us, encourage us. God, your word is about changing our heart. So God, I pray that you would do that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So God's prophet has run away when God actually told him to go preach to his enemies. This would be the equivalent of uh, God calling a Jew in World War II to go to Berlin and uh, basically declare to Hitler that Jesus loves him, that, that Jesus wants to save him. This would be the equivalent of what Jonah has been called of God to do, to go to the Ninevites. Jonah didn't want to, so he runs away. God said, go east, he goes west. He's trying to flee to a place called Tarshish. Uh, it's the furthest, at the time, the furthest west you could go, known to man in Jonah's day. And Jonah started to realize that no matter where he ran to, God was already there. That no matter where he runs to, God is already pursuing him as he runs. See, we can run from God, but we cannot outrun God. So all of us in this room, we can make decisions and choices to turn from God, to try to run from God, but I will guarantee you will always meet God where you're running because God's a pursuer of you. You cannot outrun God. So God sends a storm we've seen. It's an intervention. It's not a punishment. He's going to try to get Jonah back. Uh, Jonah is down in the boat, sleeping in the darkest corner. Uh, God tries to speak through the pagan captain to Jonah to wake him up. And what we saw was this just isn't a physical wake-up call to Jonah. It's a spiritual wake-up. God then tries to get Jonah by speaking through the sailors, Jonah still does not repent. He doesn't own up to what he's done, uh, what he's doing in disobedience to God. And finally, Jonah says this, I would rather die than obey God. That's where Jonah's at. So as a result, 
The sailors are forced to throw Jonah overboard. As soon as they throw Jonah overboard, we see the storm stops. It's the center point. When you run from God, you can end up in the strangest of places. And I mentioned last week, if you've ever had that nap, or you just fell asleep maybe on a city bus, wherever it is, and you wake up, you have that moment of panic sometimes where you're like, where am I? Or uh, you wake up and you go, how did I get here type of deal. This is Jonah's experience. He is in the strangest of places. And in our story, uh, everything has happened so quickly. For some of us, one small choice to run from God, maybe in one area when we were in our 20s, and maybe now we're in our 40s, and we're going, I've run from God for about 20 years. I've sat with people who have gone, Howie, I knew when I was 25 God was leading me here. Now I need to obey him, and they're now in their 40s. We can make those decisions, those choices to run from God. What's even scarier and a harder place to be is that wherever we run to, the consequences could be frightening. Uh, but no matter what, we still see God meets us in those dark places. He always does. Jonah's been running, and God finally slows him down. It's not that Jonah's out running God, but God needed to get Jonah's attention I believe some of us stop running because God is about to get our attention. And I always call these the crossroads of life. God in his grace leads us numerous times to crossroads. What are we going to do when we hit those moments? Uh, God didn't need Jonah, but Jonah needs God. And God is relentless in his pursuit to get Jonah's attention. What do you do when you have made a mess of life? And you don't know where to go. You don't know how to get yourself back to who God wants you to be. Where do you go? Unfortunately, the pattern in life is pretty much the same. We make bad choices many times, and as a result, we eventually get broke down. You can only go so long when the engine light is on, right? If you're a personality type like me, the engine light comes on, or a noise comes basically to your car or your truck. Uh, if you're like me, turn the music up louder, right? That way you don't hear the noise. Or, oh, that engine light's, sh right? It's shining, it's glowing. Uh, that means I should get what? My truck checked, but somehow we convince ourselves it'll still run. It's all good, it's just the engine light. What happens when this happens in life. You start to sputter, stall, and then stop. Eventually, you have a breakdown. And here's what happens many times when you break down spiritually or in life. You cry out to God. And from that breakdown, if we let him, God in his mercy will cause a breakthrough. So when we break down in life and we look to God, many times he leads us to a breakthrough in our life. Now, one of the things I'm learning over and over is when breakdowns happen, don't despair. The tendency for us is freak out. Like, things have broke down. Things aren't going the way I want it. And we start to panic. We start to experience anxiety. We start to want to take control uh, but when things actually break down in life, if you know Jesus, here should be our response. There's a concern, but yet I'm going to rejoice because God knows what he's doing. So how do I rejoice when the fact is breakdown is happening? See, when breakdowns happen spiritually in our life, it's an opportunity for us to go to the depth of who we are, to go to the depth of our sin, but to also know and experience the depth of God's love, the depth of God's grace as well. Now, where I want to draw the line, I'm all about grace. But I'm not about the grace that says, do whatever you want. Because you can, some people will, will take grace and go, I can sin as much as I want because God's loving and forgiving. And I go, that's not, you don't get God's grace if that's your response. It's not that we have grace so that sin can abound. 
Uh, what I'm saying is God does not waste anything, and we can always learn and grow more and more even in our failures. So in our failures, in our breakdowns, experience the grace of God and continue to grow in God. Sometimes we may receive a uh, better grasp of truths uh, that we've known for so long when things start to break down in our life. Like when things are hard and you're leaning on Jesus many times, you experience his love and his grace to a greater depth than you ever have before. And this is what happens to Jonah. Jonah knew some things in his head. He preached it to others, and now Jonah has made a mess of himself. He's running away from God. He's now throwing overboard. He has nowhere to look except upward. That's all he has. Yet God's going to meet Jonah where he was. He's going to take him in a way to another level, another phase in his walk. And it's this process that I want to look at today. It's this process, from breakdowns to breakthroughs. So maybe you came in here, and life is hard. You would go, I'm experiencing the engine light on spiritually. I feel like I'm broke down. And God can meet us, and God can take us out of the mess that we have often made in those places, and this is what God desires to do. So if you take notes, first point, breakdowns, cause us to slow down. Breakdowns cause us to slow down. Look at verse 17 of Jonah 1. We leave Jonah, and his, he makes this choice to die. And again, we have, and the Lord. It shows up. Again, I really don't know how many times there is, and the Lord, interjection into your life, but many times, and the Lord shows up in our lives for his glory. And all of us uh, should be thankful for and the Lord during our breakdowns. See, God is always intervening in our lives. We never want God to leave us alone. Because if God really left us alone, that's truly punishment. But God doesn't. He intervenes in our lives. Here, here we see that God appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. So now we get some clues in Jonah chapter 2 that Jonah, after being thrown overboard, has actually sunk to the bottom of the sea. He's got tangled up in seaweed, and God sends his rescue vessel to save Jonah, to swallow Jonah up. Again, this is intervention. It's not punishment. This was not God pay paying Jonah back for his sin. This is God bringing Jonah back from his sin. God intervenes. And the same thing is happening to some of you. God's trying to get your attention. Like, even today, God's trying to get your attention. Some of us in this room today, God's like, I need you to wake up. I desire for you to wake up. There's no indication here that the sailors even saw this fish that swallowed Jonah. So they, are, they must have assumed Jonah's dead. He sunk to the bottom of the sea. Notice the word appointed. Because this word's going to show up again in Jonah chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. So God appoints the great fish. God basically um, appoints the plant that we'll see in chapter 4, the worm. He appoints the wind. All are appointed by God. All of it obeys God. And it's almost basically rebuking uh, God's prophet for his disobedience. So everything God has appointed, God's sovereign in all of this. Uh, the word appointed means special assignment. It means ordain. God calls this large fish to serve him at the appointed time, at the appointed place. God's sovereign over every detail. Uh, in fact, I could say some of the things you and I experience in life are like large fish swallowing us up. And God's even appointed every detail of that in your life. Now, I don't want to get into what kind of fish, and I know some of you want to argue and debate what kind of fish this is. Uh, just don't argue and debate with Howie McMaster what kind of fish this is, because I'm not going to do it. Uh, some people will go, it's a whale, it's a blue whale, it's a whale shark. However... Uh, whatever fish you want and that you're thinking of, people will go there 
And some will go, how did Jonah even survive in the fish? Uh, God made it all. God can do miraculous things. He creates this animal to swallow a man alive. Not only that, if you think about it, he's in the stomach of this big fish, so the gastric juices would have been flowing. Uh, and you would go, because if you're logical like me, you'll go, how did that not digest him? How come Jonah is going to live, and all of a sudden now you're going to struggle with a big, wh with a big whale, fish, whatever you want to label it, uh, and you're going to miss out on the real issue. Jonah is disobeying God and running in his sin. And this is where people want to go. And you will encounter some believers in Jesus who will argue on you on this. Uh, I just go, I'm not going to climb the hill. All I'll say is that would have been an awful experience. Like to be swallowed by a fish. Imagine the temperature in that belly of the fish. Uh, some people say it could have been 108, 115 degrees. Uh, picture... Uh, I'm sure this fish would have been eating other fish, all of that coming in, washing over you, bleaching your skin. Uh, I'm sure it smelled like an outhouse at the exhibition, like this isn't a great location. Uh, real quick, some of you are going, how is it even possible? And I would say no, unless God's included. So yes, with God it is possible. The whole thing is a miracle. It's a miracle that the fish was even there when Jonah got thrown overboard. It's a miracle that he stayed alive for three days. It's a miracle that this fish vomited him up onto dry land. It's all a miracle. Said this last week. If you believe that there is a God who created the world with a word and who was present in Jesus' ministry of healing the sick, raising people from the dead, then the idea of God doing special things at special times on earth in an account like this one should not trouble you. I am not troubled by the fact that Jonah got swallowed by a big fish. That, that doesn't trouble me. I would actually say this would not even make my top ten hardest things to believe in the Bible. Just wouldn't be there. If he wanted to, God could have furnished the belly of this fish with Netflix and a TV and a lighting system if he really wanted to. Jonah's choices end up in a place where he's powerless, where he's helpless. Can I tell you, when you hit those places, that's the best place to be with God when you feel powerless, when you feel helpless, and you see the power and the beauty of Jesus. Those are the places that bring you alive. R.T. Kendall says, the belly of the fish is not a happy place to live, but it's a good place to learn. It's a good place to learn uh, because there's not a lot to do inside of a fish, right? Nowhere to run. This isn't a resort. As Jonah, just picture this. As Jonah regained his consciousness, imagine the panic, like the first sensations. He, he, may, he probably felt the lining of the stomach of the fish. I'd be freaking out. Just honestly, up front, just imagine this. He's pressing it. Uh, he's got this irritation, this, uh, the acid juices of the stomach, fish coming in, his skin's beginning to be bleached, there's this foul smell, there's the passing through of the normal diet of the fish, and it's just dark in this place. Now, some would go, why a fish? Why did God send a fish? Uh, so, if you would think with me, on the possibility of maybe God sending a bird to sweep down, transport Jonah to dry land? Or why didn't God send a chariot on fire like he did with Elijah to rescue him? Uh, as I thought about this, because this is where my mind goes sometimes, uh, I believe the fish is probably the best solution to what God is going to do 
with Jonah. See, the Lord does not usually protect us from the consequences of our own choices and actions. The Bible says you reap what you sow. So some of us have made poor decisions and choices, and instead of owning that, we blame God. We go, God's out to get me. It's because I didn't do this, and now God is, is trying to get my attention, so he's punishing me. And we go to all these crazy places instead of just going, my own poor decisions and choices lead to consequences that are not well. Because 2017, who wants to take responsibility when we can blame something or someone? In his faithfulness and in God's graciousness towards us, God comes with, to us into those consequences of our choices in order to save us there. See, Jonah had chosen the sea as his escape routine, basically his escape route, and it's there that God awaits him. God will always meet us in these places. That's his grace. So we thank him for it. Uh, God does not take us out of our messes, but meets us in them. Sometimes, and I don't know why, those on, I'll just say those who maybe don't like the church, don't come to church, always think, I need to get my life cleaned up, then I'll go. But the gospel is, come to Jesus in your mess. That's the gospel. See, you come to Jesus with your mess because Jesus can clean the mess. And what we try to tell ourselves is, I need to clean up first, then I'll come to Jesus. It never goes like that. You will never clean yourself up outside of Jesus. So you come to Jesus who takes the mess and makes something beautiful out of the mess we find ourselves in. So, after we have made a mess of the situation and we take our hands off and we finally break down, we finally slow down, this is where God comes in and he starts to heal the heart. He starts to lead us in a new direction. This is the lowest place Jonah can go, by the way. Like, he's at the bottom of a sea. He's swallowed by a big fish three days, three nights, this is precisely the place where God meets him. It's the place of death. He's come to the end. And we are told he's in there three days, three nights. What's the point of the information? It's to let us know Jonah's at the point of near death. For some of you, God has encountered you at the end of your road. For others, God has been merciful and has caught you before you've hit the end of your road. But God will always meet us in those places. So Jonah's breakdown enables him to stop running, and he's forced to slow down. And our times of breakdown are so good for us. Breakdowns cause us to slow down before God, and by slow down I mean to have serious reflection about our walk in life. We are so good, Center Point, at filling our lives with stuff. That at times when God gets our attention, he brings us to those moments so that we will reflect on who we are and where we are in life. Most of us think, I'm pretty good. I have some rough edges. I have some bad habits. C.S. Lewis says this, Fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. Breakdowns reveal the depth of our sin, the rebelliousness of our heart. And I would add, uh, most of us try to fill our lives by being busy. So we don't have to deal with who we are. So we don't have to deal with our heart. Uh, we waste time many times with many things, be it materialism, uh, 
in doing things. We always are looking for a savior. When we make saviors out of entertainment, relationships, our friends, our children, our careers, whatever it is, they will always fail us. They will always fail us. And when they do, that realization is where God is trying to get our attention. God's trying to wake us up. God meets us there to show us there's only one true Savior. Uh, so don't be upset if you've had a bad week. Rejoice. Don't worry if that thing uh, that you are looking to is not functioning as your Savior the way you want it to function. And if it has failed you, rejoice. Don't even let it consume you that many times we trip up and fail in our walk with Jesus. Let that draw you back to his grace to go, I don't want to break his heart. I want to live for him. I want to walk with him. And when we do this, the realization is this, God is trying to get my attention. God is trying to speak to my heart. God will meet us there to show us there is only one Savior. Breakdowns help you slow down. And it's the moment you can tell the Lord, uh, like, God, I'm, I'm more fearful than I thought. God, I'm, I'm more filled with pride than I've ever known. I'm more superficial than ever. I'm more greedy than I ever imagined. And it's here God wants to meet you. Second, when you slow down, look up. When you slow down, look up. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Notice verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Uh, if I was writing or editing this, I would have added, finally, Jonah prayed. Finally. But don't miss the phrase, to the Lord his God. To the Lord his God. See, God is still his God. Though Jonah forsook him, though Jonah fled, uh, though Jonah refused to pray to him, though he rebelled against him, though he wanted to die rather than obey him, God is still his God. That's good news. If any of you are on the run, God is still God. If you know Jesus and you're on the run, God is still your God. This is good news. Aren't you glad that no matter what you have done or will do, God is still not ashamed to call himself as your God? That's good news. Jonah was broken down. He slowed down. He's in the belly of the fish. And when you slow down, many times you look up. There's no more running, no more excuses. Jonah has nothing left except God. It's all he has. Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8. This is Jonah's reality, and maybe for some of us. Uh, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where, where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Shoal, you are there. Jonah then pens his own psalm, his own thanksgiving of praise here in chapter 2. He is not asking, and, and notice this, he is not asking God to get him out of the fish. Did you notice? He's actually thanking God for delivering him from drowning and sending the fish. But many of us, when those, uh, I'll say, Fishes in life come and swallow us up. It's like, God, get me out. God, take it away. And Jonah here goes, thank you for sending the fish. Thank you, God, for delivering me from death. Remember that running from God is always to choose a slow death. You're going to die inwardly since God is our life source. And Jonah gets to the lowest of the low before God saves him. And when the fish swallows him, picture this. In a way, he's in a tomb. 
And notice the phrase, the belly of Sheol. Sheol is a Hebrew word that can mean hell. So when you run from God, that is what life will eventually be. And people refer to it as, I'm like living hell on earth when you run from God. But God can turn tombs into places where he uh, births something beautiful. At the moment you feel, I can't go on, God can turn that all around. When you're broken down, when you're finally slowed down, and you look up to God, no matter how bad you've been, no matter the dark place you've gotten yourself to, God can transform the place of death into a place of new life. Only God can do this. He might not take you out of the tomb, per se, but he can certainly transform the, that, that moment, that place into something new. How do you look up to God when you're slowed down? Notice here just a few things. Look up by holding firm to God's word. Jonah's psalm here is a collection of various psalms he knew from God's word. God's word becomes real. It becomes relevant to him again. It amazes me that when people break down, they're very quickly to run to the spiritual. All of a sudden, they start reading scripture. All of a sudden, they start praying. Here, Jonah now is starting to pray the word of God. This is where he finds his confidence, his hope, his motivation. This is where he finds his urgency. This is where he finds his power. All of his passion here is fueled by the word of God. So if you are in a breakdown, your solution is right here. Not only to read it, not only to have it in your minds, but to let that come in your life. I, I spoke at a teen camp at Camp Sagi not too long ago, and I had three teenage boys come up, and they were like, Howie, I really want to read God's word. What would that look like? I, all, all I simply said to them was, it's not about the, the quantity of your reading. It's about reading and letting that become part of your life. So here's my advice. Take five verses. Read them over and over. Pray, ask God, what is something you can take out of those five verses? Rate that on a sticky note. Bring that everywhere you go throughout the day. And if you do that for every day of the year, that's 365 phrases of scripture that you are living from, that is coming into your life, into your heart. That is what transforms you. You can read the Bible for the year and not be transformed. Or you can read scripture and allow it to become part of your life. This is what's happening here. So I'm encouraging, read your Bible, absolutely. Read it all the time. Uh, but take things, apply them to your life. Let them become part of you. Hold firm to God's word because God wants to get his word to you. And you might be asking God to help you. Maybe it's, God, I want to be a better student. I want to be a better spouse. I want to be a better parent. And God wants to speak to you about those things. But if you are never in his word, he will never get the message to you. If this is all you rely on spiritually, what comes out of here Sunday after Sunday, hear me, you are anemic spiritually. Like, we honor God's word, we love God's word, we'll preach God's word, but if this is all you get, you are running on empty. You need God's word. It sustains you. Here Jonah finally speaks to the Lord again, and God's word starts to nourish him. Uh, get back into God's word. If you've stepped away, get back into it. When guilty and filled with shame, look up. Look up. Sometimes we might feel so guilty for not being in God's word. We might feel so guilty for not praying, not walking the way we ought to walk. And we may have shame from the sin we have committed. We might think God is like, don't even think about praying to me. Don't even think after you run from me to come back. Uh, we might think God doesn't want to hear from me. But is that what God is like? 
even in Jonah's guilt, even in Jonah's shame, he experiences, he, he experiences God hearing his prayer. This is beautiful. I called out to the Lord. He prays. I call out to the Lord, even though I've turned my back on him. He hears me. I cried out to him, sometimes without words, but he heard my voice. Jonah realizes that God hears him. Notice that Jonah says that God threw him overboard. Did you catch that? Verse 3. For you cast me into the deep. In other words, it is right, God, that I should die for my sin. It is right that I should be punished. But notice again verse 3. Your waves, your billows, the water was God's servant to rightly punish Jonah. But somehow beneath the waves, Jonah experiences love. And we know God doesn't punish us for our sin because Jesus took our punishment. What Jonah saw a glimpse of, we see in full today. That is God's amazing love beneath our sin. We see it in full because of Jesus. So hear me. Do not let guilt and shame stop you from praying. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you to look up at him, to engage him, to call out to him, to pray. God meets you right where you are. There is love beneath the waves of guilt. There is love beneath the waves of shame. Our sin may reach far, but his grace reaches further. Our sins are deep, but his love runs deeper. When faced with the impossible, look up. Jonah sees God. Uh, basically hurling him into the sea. Jonah 2, 3. You cast me into the deep. Jonah's in an impossible circumstance. Jonah uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Question. Did Jonah feel like he'd been forgotten by God? Yes. Was he? No. Some of you might feel God has forgotten me. No, he has not. You haven't been forgotten by God. The broken heart, the financial frustrations, the lost job, the failing health have all been appointed by God in your life to draw you back to his heart of grace. God is relentless in his pursuit of those he loves, uh, and he brings you to those places. Notice verses 5 and 6. The waters closed in over to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. It would be one thing to fall overboard when the sea was calm. It's another to be thrown overboard when the waves are probably 20, 30 feet high and they're coming at you. Uh, God allows these things. Why? Uh, I think it's so that God gets all the glory. I think God, and, and, and this has been preached so wrong, some people often will say, uh, God will only let you experience what you can handle. The Bible never says that. Some well-meaning Christians have said that. Uh, what the Bible's declaring is, you will face things in life that will overwhelm you and you cannot handle in your own strength. That's why you need God. So Jonah declares in verse 9, salvation belongs to who? The Lord. Jonah declares salvation belongs to the Lord. It's all you, God. Like, Jonah can take no credit in being alive. He hasn't kept himself alive. God has saved him. So you look up in hope. When you break down, notice a couple of times in this chapter that Jonah mentions the temple, verse 4 and verse 7. Once he ran away from the Lord, he was thinking, I will never be allowed ever in the place where God's presence dwells. Jonah is in a place of hopelessness. Oh, center point. If, if what people need right now in Prince Edward Island is hope, 
Like my heart breaks. There are so many people who just take their lives. Do you know why? They hit that road of hopelessness. Hopelessness has led them to those places. Jonah's in a place of hopelessness. The weeds like chains are wrapping around my head. The bars are like a prison. They're closing around me forever. That's what it takes for a lot of people. So hear me. It maybe is an accident, a bad health report, a relational issue, an addiction that you can't shake. For some, it's a prison sentence. And I've heard Christians many times when people hit these moments, some of them will, will give their heart to God and some Christians will go, oh, they don't mean it. They just want out of the situation. For some, that might be true. But I believe God encounters people when they're at their end. I believe God encounters people when they hit that road and go, I, I have no hope. I believe God can come in and say, there's a lot of hope. And a lot of times, many people hit these places. And, and if you've been changed by the grace of God, center point, it is nothing you have done to rescue yourself from there. It is God by his grace and his glory pulling you through. And at the end, when people give testimony and they witness to this fact, all they can do is say it was God. See, God is a God of living hope. Hope says I was lost, uh, but God has found me. God has not given up on me. My days ahead are good because you are with me. Uh, Jonah felt like there's no hope, but there was. God's at work. He hadn't put Jonah in a chamber of death. Uh, if you could picture it this way. He put him in a temporary hospital bed where he was going to minister to him and heal his heart. Uh, Jonah is celebrating deliverance while he's still in the, the belly. Uh, you brought my life up from the pit. He's celebrating. He won't be uh, basically vomited out of the fish till verse 10, but he's saying you have brought my life up from the pit third thing and then we'll close breakdowns lead to breakthroughs look at the last verses of Jonah 2 and notice the phrase steadfast love it's a Hebrew word and, and I love this word because in the Hebrew it refers to God's faithful covenant love for his people Here, here's what I want you to see as we close Jonah in his breakdown realizes that the idols that, that people are running to do not hold weight. Uh, Jonah realizes that God's love is just not for his covenant people, but it was also for the Gentiles. And now Jonah gets the realization that this love just isn't for, uh, at the time, Israel. His love was for all. So they're included. The Gentiles now are included in this uh, covenant love of God. This is God's grace. Jonah gets to witness God's grace. And notice he ends by basically saying, I will be obedient to God. I will go wherever you want me to go. Grace has freed me. Grace has changed me. I will do whatever you want me to do. I am yours, God. I understand that salvation belongs to you. So God, you can save whoever you want. And when God accomplished what he wanted in Jonah for that time, the fish obeys the Lord and brings Jonah to dry land. Uh, here's what we're going to find out. Jonah doesn't get it. He goes to Nineveh, but his heart still doesn't get it. But God is going to try to capture Jonah's heart. So as we close, I don't know if you feel like you're in a mess spiritually. Uh, if you're like me, sometimes I don't know where to begin. Like, I, I come to God, I'm like, okay, God, like, like where? Maybe we've been distant for a while. Maybe we're wondering, how do I start this again? How do I come back from my wandering, my running? But Jonah 2 tells us that no matter how dark of a place I'm in, I can slow down. I can look up to God. If that's you, open up God's word again. Let God speak to you from the belly of the problem or the mess you're in. And I'm also wondering... Uh, 
if we really understand grace. Uh, when it comes to grace, uh, I just go, I, I don't know if we'll completely understand it, but it's so beautiful to know that God's grace, undeserved favor reaches out to me. And even when I am captured in it, I truly, uh, I, I cannot comprehend it to a great extent. It's so deep. There's a verse in the Bible that says, God's grace upon grace upon grace. And if you study it out, it just keeps going. God's grace, God's grace. Uh, God's grace is poured out. So hear me, if you are in a mess today, God reaches out to you in grace. Will you allow him to pull you out? Will you line up your life to live for his glory? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the hope we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I want to pray if there's anyone in this space today who would go, I feel I'm in the mess of life. I, I feel like I'm in the belly of a problem. Uh, God, may you reach down in your grace. May you rescue them. May you point them through the power of your spirit to the cross. Maybe for some, it's coming to know Jesus for the first time as their savior. Maybe for some, it's getting rid of the guilt and the shame that they no longer have to carry if they are found in Christ. So God, my simple prayer is that you would rescue us from the messes of life that we would look up, that we would see a God who is filled with steadfast love, that we would see a God that despite running has pursued and run faster after us. So God, in this place, and even as we sing, may you set hearts free, we pray in 